Hey guys, welcome back to Prime Tweak Hours. It's currently 327, and guess what? We're learning about art history. We're in full beat learning about art history. No, but I really did want to, the more I've been thinking about like what I want this channel to be and as I'm reflecting on who I am and what I'm doing with my life, I realize I'm in a unique position where I'm lucky enough for people to like me for me. So why not share more of myself with you guys? I'm missing a nail. Um, so let's get started. Hey guys, I wanted to take a quick moment to thank the sponsor of this video, Skillshare. I feel like a true YouTuber now that I have a Skillshare sponsorship. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people like you all. I know you're so creative and inspiring. Explore new skills, develop and expand upon interests you already have. Just get lost in your own creativity. Even how to make a perfect grilled cheese, that's like definitely on there and I'm definitely gonna watch it. And especially during quarantine where I'm just sitting in my room, I've been trying to focus more on my art and like actually drawing and painting. And let me tell you, Picasso is shaking in his boots. No, Picasso is fine, but I did want to share the current class that I've been taking, which is Become a Better Artist, Drawing Essentials by Rhea Sharon. Skillshare offers membership with meaning. It offers a community of fellow creatives, encouragement, inspiration. So whether you're looking to fend off boredom, to self-care through creative means, or just join a creative community, Skillshare is here to keep you learning. Keep learning! And guess what, people? I've got you covered. Skillshare is doing two months of a premium membership for free. Literally premium membership for free. And then after that, it's like 10 bucks a month. That's available to the first thousand people who click the link in my description. Okay, back to the video. I kind of want to make this a series on my channel because art history is so cool. Ew, it's cool, it really is. And it's cool to see how human understanding of emotion and religion and all the things that we still grapple with today, obviously, because no one has any answers yet. That dialogue has like shifted and changed over time. It's really, really interesting and I really enjoy learning about it. So without being too nerdy, it, I want to tell you guys about this painting that I, well, it's actually a, it's called a freeze. It's like a fresco. A fresco is what like Michelangelo did. It's like usually like a mural, it's a wall mural, but it's okay, anyway. I just learned about it and I'm kind of obsessed with it. And um, I think Klimt is, Klimt is one of my favorite artists and he did a really interesting take on this. So let's get into it. I'm not wearing a bra and also, um, do you like my open sign? The AC just kicked on, so don't worry about it. So today we're gonna be learning about the Beethoven freeze by Gustav Klimt, painted in 1902. This was created for the 14th exhibition of the Viennese Secession. And I have some notes here, so don't mind if I read off. The Secession was a resignation from the Association of Austrian Artists, which was in protest of the support for like the traditional art style, you know, like kind of more conservative. Klimt and his peers wanted to take their artistic vision in a different direction that the current administration, ew, didn't really agree with. Not really administration, but like, you know what I mean. So this exhibition was dedicated to um, the genius of Ludwig von Beethoven. It was centered around a marble sculpture that Max Klinger made. This exhibition was really important because it was a prime example of, pardon me, German fans, please, Gesamtkunstwerk which basically means, in layman's terms, a total work of art. It encompasses all the different forms of art, sculpture, painting, music, composition, poetry. It's all, it all comes together and works together. So this work by Klimt was based on Wagner, based on Wagner's interpretation of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which more commonly is known as Ode to Joy. I'll insert a clip. which the Ninth Symphony, let me read this quote because it's beautiful, celebrates humankind's struggle on the most magnificent level by the soul striving for joy, which is reached by the unification of all arts, which is again this term, Gesamtkunstwerk. And I really like this because it's the struggle of the human self with both external evil forces as well as internalized, um, the, the battles of the heart and mind, the internalized weaknesses. So let's begin, shall we? Let's discuss the form of the art. This is traditionally, like they are, um, a narrative. You can see the same on the Sistine Chapel ceiling. It literally tells the story. This is the same. It tells the story of the human spirit trying to find happiness and eventually finding it in art. 
this. So it starts over on the left wall. It's it's kind of up high. That's um, the definition of a, a frieze versus a fresco. I love art history. So on this first wall, we encounter the genie, which yes, kind of like genies. It's the plural. English. There's these gliding female figures symbolizing the quest for happiness. You can see their eyes are closed, they're just drifting, as we all are, drifting through life looking for what is happiness, how do I find it? Now they're followed by these figures which can be interpreted as suffering humanity. They're pleading to this knight in golden armor, which the gold, if you're not familiar with Klimt, um, he painted the kiss, I'll put up here. Uh, he's very well known for his use of gold in his paintings. So we see this gilded knight, which is supposed to represent, you know, this, who is the one to embark on this quest to find joy, to find meaning. He's there ready to battle the evil forces. Behind him we see ambition and compassion, which are represented by two women. Uh, Ambition is holding a laurel um, ready to place on his head, which a laurel is what old Roman and Greek heroes Julius Caesar used to wear on their heads. It's just like pretty much the leaf, the original flower crown. And a laurel basically represents victory or triumph. So now let's move on to the second wall. This is the hostile forces. Ooh, scary. So what's striking immediately about this section is it's scary. Like it really is, that's why I kind of like it. Well, let's break down who and what these figures are, what they represent, why he painted them like this, blah, 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 blah. So big monkey man, this is Typhius. He appears in Greek mythology. He is the father to the three Gorgons, which the most famous of which is Medusa with her snake hair. A lot of art historians speculate that Typhius in this painting specifically is a personification of typhoid, which was kind of rampaging Europe at the time, specifically Vienna in the 19th century. What's interesting about his portrayal of Typhius here is Initially, you see just big monkey man, you know, with some snaggle, snaggle tooth, backhoe teeth. But upon, you know, further investigation, you see the giant blue eagle wings. You see the snake body, um, the snakes in the golden snakes, might I add, in the Gorgon's hair. I just like side note, I really like this because it's fantastical. It's almost like a cartoon. It's scary. You don't expect it. If you're familiar with any of Klimt's other work, you really don't expect something like this. And, you know, traditionally it's beautiful women and embracing couples and ooh, kissing, ooh, love, but like portraits of women. And this is just like, <laughs> it's scary. It looks like Crash Bandicoot. I kind of like it. So above them are sickness, madness, and death, which are all women. Thanks, Clamped. Now two Typhius's right are, bear with me, lasciviousness, wantonness, and intemperance. Those are all really big words and they basically just mean human lust. It's this human desire, the sexual desire, and our inability to control our desires. We are beings that seek earthly pleasures and so much of religion is rooted in how to deny those earthly pleasures for whatever reason. So this is really, you know, it's the temptation, it's the greed, it's the selfishness. It's really the little green monster on your shoulder that's represented here. If you keep going a little bit to the right, this is grief personified. She's real sad. It's the human grief. It's wanting to give up. It's, I can't find happiness. It's sorrow. It's, it's all of the negative emotions in our spiritual journeys, in our, our close friendships, and our relationships. Let's continue on to the third panel. So on the final wall, the yearning for happiness finds appeasement in, ding, 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 poetry. This is the figure holding the lyre, which a lyre is a musical instrument. And right after this, there's an empty section in the frieze where this was originally when the exhibition appeared in 1902, this was where the marble sculpture I mentioned earlier by um, Max Klinger, that's where it was. So um, that's it's just an empty space there that's still there. I don't know where the, the um, statue is now. So keep going and we see this chorus of women. This is the arts, capital T, capital A, the arts. It's five female figures representing the ideal realm, which is a place of pure joy, pure happiness, pure love. And what's to be inferred is that you can only achieve this through the arts. The freeze concludes with a chorus of angels singing Ode to Paradise, which is Ode to Joy. I like to imagine like if you're looking at it, like if I was, if I was there, if I was looking at it, in your headphones, it's like you cue it. There should be like a timestamp for each part that you're looking at. That's how it's meant to be viewed and seen is as it's storytelling of this musical piece. I mean, it really just like, 
it makes me smile. It's like every this conglomerate of art and what it means and what it means to to experience it all together at once. I wish they had it playing at all times or like they gave you a headphone so like as soon as you enter the room, you know, you can kind of it's like okay and go here and go here. anyway. Sorry. So like I said, the freeze concludes with um, a choir singing and then this powerful image of a kissing couple. And this isn't by accident or just because he likes to portray romance. This is actually because in the, the lyrics to Ode to Joy, the symphony's choir ends with the lyrics, this kiss to the whole world. And these are Schiller's lyrics, by the way. It's not, I don't think Beethoven wrote lyrics to Ode to Joy. Now let's talk about this for a second because it kind of gets me hyped. I like that Klimt doesn't focus on religion. There are no religious, arguably, there are no religious relics or symbols or icons in the whole work, which is great because the entire Ninth Symphony is so like, yes, God, can't wait to meet you. Can't wait to go to heaven, yes. And it's like so much of the music at that time, you know, all of it was dedicated to the glory of God and, and finding salvation and this, that, and the other. I think it's so interesting and it's so, oddly like brave that Klimt took that element out of it and just it was like here's art art can exist outside the scope of religion he literally is like F that i want to find human happiness where does it exist how do i get to it what does it mean where do i find it who finds it so all in all it's 34 meters long the whole thing the knight is actually full size it's seven feet tall so the knight i imagine is probably like six feet and the gist of the entire work is finding eternal bliss in art which i think is very relevant it always will be relevant i think humans need art to find true meaning and to find place that's why we rely so heavily on music it's why we get emotionally attached to music it's why we get emotionally attached to tattoos it's why when any negative thing happens in the world, humans always turn to art to express themselves because sometimes words aren't enough. This is especially true in things like when surrealism became a thing after World War I, it was like we literally could not deal with the fact that people were dying on such a mass scale for no reason. We turned to art because that's the only way that we can really cope. And it was just this reaction to the institution of like, this is illogical, it makes no sense. Anyway. Sorry, this is really nerdy. I don't know if I'll do another one of these, but I just, I just love it so much. And if y'all like learning about this, let me know. Cause I'll make a million and seven videos like this if you want me to. I have another one. I want to do like a series on like, you know, these famous paintings that everyone knows, but it's like, what does it mean? Like Andy Warhol's soup cans. Like you recognize that, but what does it mean? Like what's the history around it? Who was Andy Warhol? Like, was he an asshole? I want to do one on Picasso. Like a lot of these artists that we celebrate and we love, were really, really troubled, problematic people. Naturally, they're artists. Okay, guys, let me know. Pee pee poo poo. Also, do you like this look? Missing the front fingers? Ew, I think there's, uh, oh, there's makeup on my, and there's like hot Cheeto stains under my fingernails. Okay, I'm gonna end this video, sorry, bye.